My remarks this morning um, as uh, are I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, an organization that I'm sure everybody has now come to know as UNRWA. Uh, UNRWA has been the topic of my research, and I've dealt with UNRWA for over the past uh, three plus decades. Uh, and uh, there has been a lot to discuss and unpack when it comes to UNRWA and where it all comes from. Um, obviously, we've seen you know a great deal of news about UNRWA of late. Uh, the evidence that has been mounted by the Israeli intelligence and the and the security apparatus understanding UNRWA's direct involvement um, with the barbaric attacks that took place on October 7th. Uh, and there has been a complacency within international organizations and specifically within UNRWA at large and its ties to Hamas. Um, so let me try to contextualize all of this uh, and where it comes about, um, maybe to try to shed a little light uh, about the anomaly of this organization all around. UNRWA is the sole dedicated organization, to my mind, to the one single issue that has guaranteed that the conflict will never end. There, all of you, I'm sure, are aware. Uh, there, you know, in the history of the peace conversations, when there were peace negotiations with Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, have been devoted to three issues, Jerusalem, the disputed lands as far as 67, and, and the so-called right of return. The right of return is perceived to be as a divine right by Palestinians, and the organization that has maintained and has been the gatekeeper of the right of return at large has been UNRWA. Right of return, just to, kind of, just to contextualize, to be clear about it, is the demographic threat to basically eradicate the state of Israel through the uh, the right of return of millions of millions of individuals who will all reclaim and re basically replace Israel with a Palestinian state. It's not about two-state solution. It is basically the altering and using the demographic element here in this architecture. Over the years, uh, every proposal that has been presented to the Arab Palestinians has been rejected, and the use of the refugee mentality at large uh, has been the consistent narrative of what I would consider to be, historically speaking, the reminder of 1948, what the Palestinians defined as the Nakba. UNRWA has uniquely defined Arab Palestinian refugees, and this is important to understand. This explains the demographic understanding of where UNRWA comes about at large. As anybody who was in mandatory Palestine between 1946 and 1948, and the kicker is their descendants. No other refugee population has the descent, the lineage aspect. UNRWA has been very creative over the years, especially in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, Muslim lineage is, is patriarchal. They were able to expand it to be matriarchal, and they've been also been very clever about resurrecting the dead, double countings, uh, and, and so on and so forth, amounting to what UNRWA amounts to today between what they define into their accounts, six to seven million individuals, all claiming a right of return. Just to contextualize it for those of you who are in Israel, Arab Israelis are also considered to be Palestinian refugees, uh, according to UNRWA's account at large. Everybody is a Palestinian refugee, even if you have citizenship in another country. And so that does not negate the fact that you can demand um, and are allowed to uh, have an exercise of the right of return through UNRWA's accounting. Now, what this means also in practical terms is the fact that UNRWA continues to demand and raise money based on the so-called natural growth of refugees. So historically speaking, the United States has been the third, the, the largest Western contributor to UNRWA in the tone of about approximately $400 million annually of, of U.S. taxpayer dollars that go into this agency and continue to grow from generation to generation. Under the Trump administration, it was the first time the United States froze those monies. Um, and uh, and then that, under the Biden administration, those monies were renewed, uh, even prior to October 7th. And UNRWA has basically positioned himself as the only agency uh, that, has, that has all the 
uh, features uh, of what uh, you know an, 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 this organization should do, from civil servants to education to clinics and whatnot. Uh, UNRWA's primary function has been education. The W and the acronym of UNRWA has been kindly translated into education. The R of UNRWA, which is the UN Workers Relief Agency, uh, is really where they have lost their way or their mandate along the way. Uh, if you look historically back at the American foreign policy in the 50s and 60s, and when it came to other refugee agencies along the way, their number one primary function should have been resettlement, reintegration, and repatriation. UNRWA has basically refused to do its job as far as resettling refugees. And what you've had here is basically maintaining Arab Palestinians in a stasis uh, for all these years as a vehicle, and I would say as a mechanism to basically uh, stick it in the eye to everybody around the world uh, that the existence of the Arab Palestinian refugees is as a result of the illegal creation of the state of Israel in 1948. So as such, it is the responsibility of Israel and the rest of the world to solve the problem, which is why, by the way, no Arab country with the exception of Jordan has ever afforded Arab Palestinian citizenship in order to maintain and sustain their statelessness and the blame on Israel for the reality of 48-49, which is how they maintain the sentiment of the Nakba. I would further argue that Arab-Palestinian identity is synonymous to Arab-Palestinian refugeeness, which is why every Palestinian leader, from Arafat to other leaders till this very day, have refused to shift or accept any compromise on the right of return. In effect, the Palestinians, as we all know, have been used as a pawn. Uh, and you can cite quotations uh, from bin Laden to, um, uh, to every Arab leader, to Assad, uh, going back to people, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to leaders along, along the way, uh, going back to Mubarak and every other kind of leader, you know, that we've seen in the Arab world, basically making statements as if they want to solve um, the Palestinian issue, but in essence, they have no, they have no uh, real desire to make that happen. They'll be using them as propaganda machines, and that's how the mechanism has been used at large. And so, the conundrum that has been really put here is that UNRWA has made itself uh, the outlet for all of this to happen in, in, you know, as far as the outlet for Israelis to deal with. It's also critical to understand UNRWA is the largest employer of Palestinians. To my mind, UNRWA is a case study of where the client has hijacked a service provider in the turn of 30,000 individuals. Uh, they're about 13,000 alone in Gaza. Uh, the numbers that have come out, uh, you know, uh, involved with Hamas, so I would say it's much more than that, according to the Israeli intelligence, is in the hundreds. Uh, but UNRWA at large makes no distinction, which is really, you know, also important to understand as well, between the individuals that they hire. There is no background checks. Actually, over the years, they have refused American checklist and they refused Israeli checklist as far as who they're hiring, which means you could be an UNRWA worker, teacher, doctor, uh, clinic worker by day and a member of, as we've seen very clearly now after October 7th, Palestine Islamic Jihad, Hamas by night. It doesn't make distinction. Actually, UNRWA itself has admitted that actually it is a sign of diversity and that they have no problem hiring members of Hamas, which is, again, part of the problem of how uh, clearly uh, it was only a surprise to members of UNRWA that the servers of Hamas were underneath their offices. I guess maybe they needed a guest password. They didn't get the memo on that. But the fact is that uh, UNRWA has worked hand in hand um, with Hamas over the years. However, all of this is a symptom of a larger problem uh, and having delved into this for about oh no, over three decades now, I will tell you that we've been aware of this problem for all these years. 
And the symptoms as far as the education, the lack of the, uh, the indoctrination, the incitement, the ties to terrorism, are all symptoms of this larger problem of how UNRWA is configured uh, uniquely to any other refugee organization worldwide. There is a sister organization known as the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, in contrast to the UN um, Human Rights Commission, which is a sister refugee organization. And in contrast to UNRWA, they define refugees as only one generation. You know, put it into context, there have been millions of refugees worldwide since World War II. All of us here have our own refugee story. Uh, all have been assimilated at large, with the exception of the Arab-Palestinian refugees that continue to use this as a weapon uh, in order to keep this alive. And UNRWA has refused UNHCR's uh, definition because UNRWA had the opportunity of being created about 18 months before the UNHCR was created. And so, uh, but if you were to take the definition of one generation of refugees and, and, and parachute it into UNRWA today, if you're talking about the refugees of 48, 49, and the numbers in the scholarship differ about 10 to 15 percent, I would guesstimate we're looking at somewhere between 625 and 715 by the end of 1949. Based on where we are today, you would set you would have no more than 30,000 individuals. And by the way, there's a whole other separate uh, uh, um element of all of this. Under the Obama administration, uh, there were attempts to declassify the documents. There was a lot of back and forth where they refused to declassify the documents. But I will tell you for a fact, after much digging into all of this, you're not more than 30 or 40,000 individuals. If that were really the case, which I, uh, I tend to believe that number, uh, you could call it a full right of return and call it a day. Uh, but again, that's not the case uh, and not the, not the current condition of our Palestinian refugees who continue to use and abuse uh, these numbers. So that's part of what you're looking at here today. I would also note uh, that um, ready back in 1952, uh, we've seen uh, comments about how outrageous um, the whole architecture of our Palestinian refugees. One of the famous quotes in the Zionist corpus was given by the, one of the first heads of UNRWA in Amman in Jordan, a famous general by the name of Alexander Galloway. And the quote he gave in 52, uh, and I'm, I'll cite the quote here, it is perfectly clear that the Arab nations do not want to solve the Arab refugee problem. They want to keep it as an open sore, as an affront against the United Nations, as a weapon against Israel, Arab leaders don't give a damn whether the refugees live or die. Now, that quote was given in the 1950s uh, and was cited in congressional testimonies on the, in the 1950s all the way into the 1960s. My point is, is that the evidence about, about, you know, has been abundant about UNRWA's anomaly has been ignored uh, for the past 75 years. And which lead us, leads us, of course, to the outrageous and, of course, most damning evidence of UNRWA's constant involvement um, with terrorism and the fact that it perpetuates the problem and is a gatekeeper, as I said before, of the one single issue that maintains the fact that the conflict will never end. If you ask UNRWA officials, which I've done over the years, about when will their term ever end, and they will tell you on record when there is peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Well, at the same time, they are maintaining the one single issue that will ensure the fact that peace will never come about. And this has been the story of UNRWA at large for you know for 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 over seven you know seventy five years, uh, seven decades. Uh, UNRWA has the opportunity as a Article 22 of the United Nations of the General Assembly, that they are based on voluntary contributions. They consistently ask for more and more money based on this so-called natural growth. And they position themselves as the only outlet that can deal with Palestinians. Now, that may be true in their narrative. The fact of the matter is UNRWA should have been long uh, dissolved years ago. There are alternatives to UNRWA. UNRWA, to my mind, has a monopoly over all these services. 
if there was a functioning Palestinian authority, and if there were to be a two-state solution, which uh, I don't see it happening at this point in the game, but all the functions that UNRWA provides should be functions of Palestinian civil servants, there is a double dipping that has taken place here between USAID and UNRWA monies. All of this needs to stop and dissolve. Uh, unfortunately, um, as all of us here on the call are aware, for Israelis and for everybody around who lives in the weeds and all of this, every day is October 7th. As we are five months into all of this, uh, there's been a uh, attempt to try to water it down, sanitize UNRWA once again. Uh, the Canadians and the Swedes, and it's a, a kind of an ironic part uh, that Canada was the first Western country to defund from UNRWA under the uh, Harper government, uh, and then renewed under Trudeau, uh, is once again re-upping money. These are not going to solve the problems. There are alternatives through World for the World uh, Food Program. You need to break the monopoly. There are other alter other UN agencies one can use to get to begin with to wean Palestinian society off of UNRWA and break the monopoly. There is one of the biggest problems when it comes to UNRWA at large is UNRWA is one big black hole. Every time we've asked for an audit, they will. there is no transparency, there is no accountability. They can't tell you how many laptops they bought, how many books they bought. They don't know any of that. It's one big black hole, all saying that you are maintaining and helping poor Palestinian refugees. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there's already data that already by the 1970s and 80s, the majority of the individuals that we're talking about today have all been already resettled. Um, when we talk about refugees in general, there is a kind of a Western cognitive dissonance that exists that you're talking about African countries who are fleeing for their lives with no running water, let alone Wi-Fi. That's not the case with the Arab-Palestinian narrative. They are a bureaucracy that has built its reputation on corruption, uh, but all and co and co-option and, and, and being co-opted by terrorism. But like I said before, which is really the critical part, they are the client. This is a case where the client has hijacked a service provider. Only the leadership at large are internationals, Europeans who buy into the indoctrination. If you don't buy into it. Uh, there is like maybe a handful of individuals I can tell you over the years, if you go against the orthodoxy, who have been fired. But we have enough evidence to say that UNRWA is, shall no longer exist. And there should be a plan, plan in place, the beginning with weaning off Palestinian society off of UNRWA services, that the day after tomorrow, UNRWA should not be in the game of providing these services. And that's the tension we're in now. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, what needs to be clearly understood for everybody who is concerned about UNRWA. But if UNRWA is that service provider, when there is, you know, in the day after tomorrow scenario, this will only amplify the problem and will also cause more problems. We are at a point now, given all the abundance of the evidence out there, that this needs to stop and it needs to stop yesterday. But my point is, as I said before, this has been going on for seven plus decades, uh, and there's ample evidence to show why UNRWA should be out of business yesterday. So on that note, I will end, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to tackle them. But I thank everybody for your time. Well, first of all, Asif, I mean, I will tell you your words, at least for me, uh, I found them to be concise and very educational. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, we're a little short on time, but I we 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 have a lot of questions. I am going to just reveal one of the questions to you, um, and that's besides Gaza, where else does UNRWA operate? Any other countries? Yeah, so UNRWA operate their UNRWA offices in Lebanon and Syria. Uh, you know, predominantly the area in the Palestinian areas um, is where they've been operating. Uh, but the majority of the, the operations are within the Palestinian areas. Um, ironically, when the civil war was happening in Syria and Palestinians were fleeing towards the offices in Lebanon, uh, they shut them down and said, no, 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 we can't take care of you. So it, the, even there is a gold standard of refugee status, even within the Arab world, when it comes to the gold standard of maintaining and sustaining Arab-Palestinian refugees. Great. Well, 
Again, thank you so much for joining us today. I do want to note that Asaf is a member of the JNF Global Speakers Bureau, and you can reach out to, to us to help bring him to your community. Visit us at jnfglobalspeakers.org. So thanks again, Asaf. Thank you so much.